the Deep Dive Spirituality Conversations podcast. I'm your host, Brian Russell, and today it's my privilege to be speaking with Mark Scandrett. Mark is the author of The Ninefold Path of Jesus, Hidden Wisdom of the Beatitudes. He's the executive director of Reimagine, a center for integral Christian practice, in addition to leading workshops worldwide. Mark teaches in the doctoral program at Fuller Seminary and serves on the creative team for Nine Beats Collective. Mark's other books include Free and Practicing the Way of Jesus. He lives with his family in San Francisco's Mission District. Those of you who are interested in the, the connection between mission and deep spiritual spiritual formation are going to love this conversation. Mark and I go deep into his new book, and we really get into a coaching conversation because this book shows how to actually apply the Sermon on the Mount into our lives using questions, embodied practices, and Mark kind of casts a vision for how we can use this in our communities to become more like Jesus Christ. So I hope you enjoy this conversation as much as I did. Hey, Mark, welcome to the show. Hey, great to be with you, Brian. Yeah, can you share some key moments in your uh, spiritual journey that's led you now to really a a lifetime of ministry in various roles, uh, including most recently your work at Reimagine, and then your teaching, speaking, coaching, and the writing, including um, this your new book, The Ninefold Path of Jesus, Hidden Wisdom of the Beatitudes. Sure. Well, I, I, you know, what, by the time you get to be my age or your age, there's lots of life to pick from, but yeah. I'll, I'll tell about one pivotal moment. And that would be, uh, I came to, um, pastoring early in life and, uh, at about 26, I came to a kind of a crisis in that role. I was getting up every Sunday to, uh, well, working hard to prepare for preaching two sermons a Sunday and, um, uh, both the exegetical work and the craft of creating a compelling message. And um, I would get up there to speak and my best friend would fall asleep on the, on the second row. <laughs> and, and I realized that the contract that we had going between audience and teacher, I wasn't really being changed by, by it. And I doubt that the audience was either. I was giving them what I would call the book report, where I'd, I would tell them what I'd read and studied and try and download it into their brains. And that, uh, in contrast, I realized I, I had grown a lot more in my spiritual life by taking new risks and taking on spiritual disciplines or spiritual formation practices. And, um, and that led me to kind of, I think, critique my own understanding of Christian spirituality and and also looking out on the communities that I was a part of and say, are we are we experiencing the kind of transformation promised by the gospel? And if we aren't, are our methods consistent with the way Jesus made disciples? And um, my aware my sense was and then and I think is still true today that. I think the way in the Western world we've tended to see formation or discipleship has tended to be individualistic, information-driven, and largely disconnected or dishonest about the real struggles in our lives. But if we look at the New Testament and we see and notice how Jesus went about being having that rabbi-apprentice relationship, uh, he did things in community. Um, he didn't just give information, but it invited disciples or would be disciples into risks and adventures with them. And then he was rigorously honest about the human condition and, um, talked to the heart of the things that we struggle with, you know? And so with, with that in mind, uh, I've been mentored a bit when, once I moved from the Midwest to California and spent some time with somebody by the name of Dallas Willard. Yeah. And I loved his larger picture or understanding of the message of Jesus as being the message of the kingdom of God, a message that's not just about the events of the New Testament or the future, but about life in the here and now and how we can experience that with God life and participate in what God is doing. But I said to him one day, um, how would we, how would I create a community as a church planter around this compelling message of the kingdom? And 
with in a deceptively simple way, he said, um, he said, I think a group of people should look at what Jesus did and taught and then try to do those things. And I sort of thought, duh, that's when I first started reading the gospels as a 12 or 13 year old, I sort of instinctually tried to do that. And it really changed my life. And then I, I felt like I was sort of catechized away from that primal journey of following Jesus into a more doctrinal understanding rather than uh, you know, rooted in, in experience in my life. So with that in mind, I, I, took, I took his words as sort of a marching order and we formed our church plant and what eventually became the organization that I work with called Reimagine. Uh, an orientation towards a more of a lab mm -hmm. focus in the early days, we called it the Jesus dojo J and forgive me for that cultural appropriation, but the, yeah. the sense was the way Jesus made disciples is more like a karate studio than a college lecture hall. And so if we want to experience that revolution in our lives, we need um, uh, a faith practice that deals with more immediacy and um and group experience and so um that that's probably the biggest turning point for me was to uh, adopt a more practice-based approach to my christian spirituality and my leadership as a as a pastor as well did that did that shift that you make because that's just really interesting the way that you described that i just wrote down doctrine doctrinal versus a laboratory approach and was that a natural shift for you, or did you feel like you're actually pushing against your yourself in a way that you had to actually stretch, or did that actually take you back to kind of how you actually tick, if you will? Yeah, I mean, I would say, you know, there's that place that says, watch your life and doctrine closely, persevere in them, and you'll save both yourself and your hearers. So I don't want to create set up a binary between yeah. Yeah. the two, but I definitely feel like in the Western world and in in my, um, I, I came up in the pietist uh, tradition as well, that the tendency had, had been towards an intellectualization of, of faith or believing, theoretically believing or giving assent to certain propositions was the primary gain. And I, it just um, left me feeling vacant, you know, not, and, and haunted by the fact that I wasn't, I knew that I was not prepared to live in the way that Jesus did, or that I was not experiencing the peace or joy um, that was promised uh, by the gospel. And I think my, my father was a big influence on me. He, um, uh, we, we had a pretty rigorous kind of family spiritual practice where we'd read scripture together and as a child and he'd ask questions and then say how are we going to live this out together what is, who are our neighbors and um and so i i think he was partly responsible for me shifting to that and so for for me and the family i grew up in the lived life of faith that we had in our family and in our neighborhood was more more vibrant and alive to me than just going to church on Sundays and Wednesdays and things like that. So that kind of began the seed of my discontent, I guess. Do you have any opinion on like you're a church planner and forgive me, I didn't look up. I don't know how big a church is anything that you ever uh, served, but when you talk about running a church again, I, I agree. There's it's, it's a spectrum. You need, you need to have it. It needs to be embodied, but obviously doctrine is important. So we don't, we're not trying to play those two things off, but mm -hmm. it seems like to me from a traditional church perspective, it's probably easier to make it about the doctrine than it is to default to making it more like a lab. And even when you say the word lab, I think small room with lots of tubes and a few scientists working versus I'm giving a lecture in a big lecture yeah. hall. And so is there a limit to how big a community could grow to in, in terms of being centralized if the pastor chooses to, to go more of let's teach doctrine within a lab setting versus just send out the doctrine from, say, the pulpit? Do you have any thoughts about that? Yeah, for pastors I, that might be I listening? think the I think the larger question is, what is the contract? Yeah, yeah. And um, there's there's usually an uh, implicit contract 
in most churches about what the role of the leaders are yeah. and what it means to be a participant. And, you know, we have some clear marching orders from uh, the Great Commission, go make disciples, um, teaching them to obey everything I taught you. So we're not really being leaders in the way of Jesus if we're not creating contexts in which people are learning to forgive and let go of resentments, um, uh, love their enemies, um, learn, learn to have the kind of interactive mystical relationship with the creator God that Jesus had, you know? Um, and so um, I think like, you know, I, I was impressed with those places in the New Testament where, like in the book of Hebrews, remember your leaders who spoke the word of God to you, consider the outcome of their way of life mm -hmm. and imitate their faith. And I started to reflect on the churches that I'd been a part of growing up that mostly I, I really didn't know the, the one who was preaching. Yeah, uh, yeah. You know, I, all I knew is what they would say from that podium. So apparently in the economy of the New Testament, a leader in the way of Jesus is someone who models, and Paul was definitely into this, follow me as I follow Christ, models this. So we need spaces of honesty and authenticity and, and life on life. Mm -hmm. So I think there's some use to the, the sermon task, but um, so much attention goes often goes to that and very little attention to leaders walking life on life with people, teaching them, uh, teaching one another or learning together about how to practice the way, the way of Jesus. So I'm a big advocate of what I call renegotiating the contract That's good. and um, making it, making it clear uh, when, when I guess teach at churches now, uh, because I'm not my role isn't in a local church anymore, but I'll say, um, just want to be aware of what, what our contract is here. Uh, I'm supposed to be share scripture, be wise, maybe a bit entertaining, make you laugh or cry a little bit. Your job is to laugh at my jokes, uh, nod, nod in approval to what I say. Maybe, maybe if you want to make me feel real good, you take notes on what I say and then shake my hand when you walk out the door. But I'll say, let's be honest that contract isn't, isn't changing me and it's not changing you. So what if we hack it a little bit? What if, what if I make a commitment to be a bit more authentic and vulnerable with you? What if instead of me talking the whole time, I invite you to turn and talk to someone else or ask me a question or interact with me? What if we get up and do something together to take on, to, an exercise or a practice during this time. And then, and then I'm going to suggest a practice that I, at the end of the, my talk that I'd invite you to consider taking on this week so that we're really learning to, to walk out the Jesus way uh, together. Um, so I don't, I don't think size is as, as important as um, like inviting a new kind of contract of authenticity um, trust and shared, shared taking on of practice that the, 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 like, think back to that karate studio picture there, you wouldn't show up to a karate, karate stu, uh, dojo um, in street clothes with a notepad. Like you're not. And I, and I think we, Jesus really has a, has a full, full bodied way for us to learn to be his disciples that isn't a passive note-taking experience. It's much more interactive and engaged. And so I'm, I'm interested in being in those, those kind of spaces. And, and maybe in some ways, the Sunday gathering is a advertisement for the deeper journey that can happen in small groups uh, that are well facilitated during the week that uh, allow for that I think 12 to 15 is a pretty good size for that kind of life on life interaction. Um, I'll say this and forgive me for if it's a little provocative, but I think the Sunday morning tends to be the most resource intensive and least transformative venue in your average church. 
And I was just talking with a pastor the other day who was pained by this saying, I know we put most of the energy, most of our volunteer hours are going towards the technology and the music that's required. And that most of those things are peripheral to what it means to be, to live the spiritual life. So when do we get to the, when do we get to that stuff? You know, of, mm-hmm. No, that was, that was actually fantastic, Mark. I think that was one of the best answers I've ever had to a question on my podcast. I absolutely <laughs> loved it. That's so good too. And I mean, and, and you know, we, I don't want to get this going off the sideways, but you know, so many pastors have struggled over the last 14, 15 months because they lost the Sunday morning service. And in some parts yeah. of the country, it's barely even back yet. And wondered if people are going to show back up when in a sense, um, I've thought in my own heart, and a lot of the pastors that I've worked with, I mean, I've just said, let's go deep on spiritual practices. Let's teach people basically how to feed mm-hmm. themselves and, um, and, and let's it, do it kind of move. I didn't talk anything like what you just said, but I, I think you just kind of gave the recipe to move forward, which is one of the reasons I, I just love your book. I mean, I think if pastors are thinking, geez, are people going to come back? Well, maybe they don't need to come back. Maybe we just need to send them down the ninefold path of Jesus and, and, and they'll be back in some form, but let's just transform lives, let them transform others. And then we can just be astonished about what might happen down the road on a Sunday at some point. Right. So Mm-hmm. Well, and it's, I understand, I empathize because yeah. uh, I think we were, we were um, trained to think that that one way communication was how we were going to be, how we were to make disciples. And uh, um, a lot of times it's a big shift for particularly the lead pastor to say, I'm going to I'm going to get into a small group or I'm going to start a small group. Uh, m- many ministers I know have actually had really amazing spiritual formation journeys. They've been part of Renovare Institute mm-hmm. or um, the Transforming Center. And I just say, let's go further. And whatever good things you've experienced I- in those contexts, could that inform how you do how you do your work in your local church. So maybe invite people to practice centering prayer with you, or you, you know how transforming it's been for you to care about people who are on the margins and, and suffering and struggle. So you organize your week so that you can invite people to go with you down to the soup kitchen or um, to, to serve and reach out in some way. Um, I think there's a way, there's a, definitely a way to, reimagine and hack what it means to be a pastor so in a way that might lead to better, um, better results and actually more satisfying work. You know, I can't tell you how many pastors that I've talked to have said, I don't know if I can really be an authentic follower of Jesus and a pastor at the same time, because <laughs> the pastoral ends up being so administrative yeah. and uh, political and um, I think it's it's worth saying what can what can I do to change to really prioritize um, being and making disciples as part of my role. It's good. Let's just jump in for a couple minutes on the ninefold yeah. path of Jesus. Um, and you talk in that book, and I loved it um, at so many levels. It's 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 such a great book, and I think it'd be so helpful for really everybody listening to get a copy and even and then go through with other people and in in, with a couple other people in a group because you have it set up almost like a coaching program. But you know the, the core piece is you got nine beatitudes, um, and then and you talk about basically you describe them, um, and I thought this was just brilliant um, as nine shifts in consciousness, mm. and 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 I liked how you linked each of the nine beatitudes you got underneath of it and you connected it to learning to essentially manage, or I guess I'm going to use your language, reimagine or reframe our kind of natural instincts that um, our brain sometimes love. It's our amygdala just freaking out about the life around us. I love that. So could you say a little bit about in your own thinking, how biology, neurology sets us up for the actual need for real, what I like to call deep dive spiritual formation. Yeah. First, let me say I'm, I'm in the book, I'm using the Beatitudes as a way of surveying the whole of the Sermon on the Mount. Yeah. You know, yeah. Uh, my mentor, Dallas Willard said that the Sermon on the Mount is the closest thing we have to the curriculum for Christ likeness. So there's nine windows into the core themes in the, in the Sermon on the Mount. And I'm assuming that Jesus had an accurate understanding of 
who God is, who he was, our identity and how life works. Um, yeah, he he's basically when he says kingdom of God, I think it, it's synonymous with him saying reality is this. Sometimes when we look at the Sermon on the Mount, we can see a list of shoulds yeah. that we could feel shame about. Yeah. I'm not good at, I don't want to, I'm, it's hard for me to love my enemies. I don't, I worry a lot. And Jesus tells me not to. And what I wanted to do was get underneath that and say, actually, Jesus is naming these first instincts of the human condition. Mm -hmm. And then if we could learn to take another look, repent, re reimagine, rethink our thinking and see as see ourselves in God and, and the world as Jesus did, we, we would naturally be able to live in this transformed way. And so um, for each uh, of the themes of the Beatitudes, I suggest a biological or neurological component where we have these first instincts. You touched on the first one, that, that fight or flight response where our, uh, in stressful situations, our amygdala produces chemicals that basically cut off access to the prefrontal cortex. So we live in a heightened sense of anxiety. And uh, this, I think, relates to that first beatitude, blessed are the poor, the poor in spirit. When we feel like we don't have enough, our first inst instinct is to close our hands and close and close fisted anxiety and worry. And so um, maybe this is biologically necessary for survival, but if we don't learn to more deeply trust in our creator and in the abundance provided and in the people in our lives, then we, we end up living in this heightened state of anxiety that becomes very toxic to us. And so there's a shift there from that first impulse that's built in biology to saying, could, can I trust and open my hands in a, in, a, in a more posture of trust to receive what I need with thanks, to ask, seek, and knock for what I feel I lack, and to, to name those desires. And then I think generosity flows out of this. How can I live in the uh, abundance of the economy of the kingdom of God? An, another example, a pretty poignant example would be um, that I think, I, uh, you know, recent research suggests that there's a biological component to racism that our, our brains are primed to recognize uh, facial features and skin tone. And when someone looks like me, I've, I naturally trust them a little bit better. I give them the benefit of the doubt. But if, if their facial features and skin tone are different than mine, I'm on alert and there's a signal that says not safe. So we really, th this is a point at which we really need to move beyond or transcend our biology in order to live in the, in, in the character of the kingdom of God. Uh, another interesting one is that uh, references where Jesus says, blessed are those who mourn. Our natural instinct is pain avoidance. Yes. And so, and, and this is necessary when we go through particularly early life trauma, we'll sometimes forget what happened or we need to, we, we need to see, we, we, we want to self-soothe or seek comfort, but a lot, a lot of us, and probably most, most of us, to some extent, we found ways to avoid or distract ourselves from what's painful, but not in ways that are actually healing. And so the promise of that beatitude is if we have the courage to name and sit with what's hard, but and it could be how we've been hurt and the pain we carry. It could be the guilt of the pain that we've inflicted on others or ways that we participated in unjust and systems of, and structures of injustice. That if we can sit with those things, that, um, that a divine sense of solace can meet us in the midst of those things. But we rob ourselves of that opportunity by by con continually living in distraction and this probably this falls right into probably what you bring up in your book about centering prayer that it's a really powerful practice of 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 sitting with the uh and feeling the feels and be, you know um not running to distract ourselves from those things and this is one of those points particularly that you know 
we're, we're in a culture right now of epi epi epidemic distraction. Yes. Where uh, we're not processing our pain and, um, and, and finding those healing ways. And we need to figure out good ways to limit and discipline our screen time and our, the amount of work that we take on and have those pockets of baseline in our day where we can be still and know that God is. I know when I was reading through the book, I got uh, right to chapter, well, it's chapter six, and you're doing the way of right motive. And, and I started reading through there and I'm like, okay, this is starting to hit really close to home now. And then, <laughs> um, and then it was interesting because that's the chapter where you actually talk about, um, I think it's the chapter you talk about centering yeah. prayer in here somewhere. And then I thought, yeah, wow. Okay. And then I thought, this sounds like a three on the Enneagram a little bit too. And then when I was reading through this, and then I get to the back of your book, and then you make all these connections, which I found really fascinating. You have these nine shifts, you got the nine Beatitudes, you have these practices. And I've always considered centering prayer kind of a core practice for the mm -hmm. basically the two, three, four on the Enneagram, that the, the heart center, whatever. And, and there it mm -hmm. is. So, so you made, how did you make the connection to Enneagram and the Beatitudes? Because I found that really helpful. And I can see people that use that tool. They could, that could enhance the, you know, the, the ability to use your book. Not that we would only read one chapter, obviously, but because it's the whole thing. But how'd you make that connection? I thought that really interesting. Yeah. Well, first, um, my sense is if, if Jesus in the Beatitudes is naming these vulnerabilities of the human condition, nine different ones, because there are nine statements in the Beatitudes, yeah. um, that, that um, uh, each of us, maybe by, by personality, find some of those Beatitude realities more easily, easy to, it's more, it's easier for us to live in certain dimensions of the kingdom of God than others. Yes. And that corresponds with some of the basic kind of features of the Enneagram typology that there's points where, uh, based on personality or uh, on our orientation, where we, we have these blind spots or these places of distorted thought or attention. And, um, and so uh, I, th I think there's a really amazing correspondence there. There's some things that are easier and some things are harder for each of us about living in the truth and the reality of, of who we, we truly are. And um, so, um, so for each beatitude, I suggest a corollary uh, Enneagram type that finds that particular beatitude challenging. But if they can really learn to live in the truth of it, it will really accelerate your, your growth. You know, so you mentioned the way of right motive, uh, uh, blessed are the pure in heart for they will see God. So we all have this natural tendency to be aware, somewhat to be aware of how we're being perceived by others. And um, that can result in a sense of shame and a sense that I need to perform or present myself in a way. And uh, psychologists call this the mask yes. or the persona. Um, and for people who identify as Enneagram threes, um, that's a particular the, um, place of vulnerability and over attention to how I'm being seen by others. And it can be challenging, difficult to distinguish Am, who, who am I really uh, and, and compared to what I'm doing to perform or to manage my image for others? And so there's a real invitation in that beatitude to instead of being um, managing image and thinking that my achievements or appearance are who I am, to take off the mask and allow, first of all, God to see me as I truly am. To, have, to understand that God's gaze towards me is tender and kind and receiving. And then also, uh, well, if, when we're wearing a mask, uh, if I'm wearing a mask and you're wearing a mask, we're not really connecting with each other. And mm -hmm. uh, I think a lot, of, a lot of threes in particular, sometimes they know that, they sense that there's this gap. And so the invitation is to take off the mask, to risk saying, here's who I really am warts and all and that allows for i think more more wholeheartedness and and intimacy to take place you know 
No, that's, that's so good. And it was just, and it was just really interesting. I mean, I'm not going to make this about my personal coaching session with you, but it was just, I, I loved reading that chapter. And to me, that was like, um, to me, um, kind of anecdotal evidence about the kind of the veracity of, of what, of what you're covering and what you're talking about. Cause I know, um, what was this, when I started doing centering prayer, you mentioned a lot of feelings come up and stuff, but the thing that I noticed, <clears throat> at least for myself. And again, I'm, I'm a, I, I'm a three. That's what the test uh, says. Mm-hmm. I'm hoping I'm a, a, a positive version of a three these days, but yeah. uh, I, I'm definitely, definitely a three. <laughs> and, um, but I noticed one of the things I would sort of tell people is like, I, I began to recognize my, all the mixed motives in my life. And I just started yeah. owning them without apologizing. And I knew that was the centering prayer stuff coming up in there, but it's just, it's just fascinating how these things fit together. And so I just want to say, I really, that was the chapter that jumped out. And then again, I love that you even said the, the centering prayer piece and that's uh, and that helps. I mean, the, this whole, and in, in the, the fact that you have these embodied practices, like to me, <laughs> What, what that actually ends up doing is all the, to me, spiritual formation helps us to make this big reversal because most of us tend to think that our motives are, uh, well, most of us know that we're very complicated on the inside, but then we mm-hmm. project kind of a single mindedness on everybody that we meet. So we reduce a person to whatever we want them to be a label or something. And I think mm-hmm. these spiritual practices open it up to say, the very complexity that God has shown me in my life and still accepting me with by grace, I have to literally extend that to everybody I meet, which can mm-hmm. be a little uncomfortable, obviously, because it makes things really complicated, especially when we're talking about enemies and stuff. But that seems to be a, a key shift. And again, I just think, um, I don't know if that's what you were trying to do with the book, but that's, I could see that the, the practices that you have here doing that for folks, if they would really mindfully yeah. work through these chapters. What, one more thought on the uh, Enneagram is that um, I know f- particularly for, for people who identify as part of the Christian tradition, it can seem like a foreign vocabulary. Yeah, yeah. And so I, I love it that there's nine Beatitudes, nine Enneagram types, because, be, and that we see some, you know, that, that there's some, um, there's some resonance there so yeah. that we don't have to introduce a completely different typology that we can just say, we can stay inside of scripture to explore. And, you know, I, I make the connection. Uh, I'm actually teaching a doctoral course on the Enneagram and spiritual formation for Fuller this fall. And I make the suggestion that Jesus temptations in the wilderness are, are, are really paired well with the, the three intelligence centers and vulnerabilities mm. of the Enneagram. But one other thing you were, I wanted to touch on that you kind of brought up here, and maybe this is a really nerdy kind of thing about spiritual disciplines is that I find sometimes when spiritual disciplines are taught, it's like, here, try this discipline. It's good for you. And I think this spiritual disciplines are a means towards a greater end. So it's not the goal just to fast or just to practice centering prayer, but um, I like to connect the practices or disciplines to those pain points to say um, the, the, the practices address features of our false self mm-hmm. and um, our woundedness and, and to help people get in touch with those, then taking on the practice or the discipline can f- feel like, yes, I, I need something that's going to help me overcome this. And the, the, so there's that, you know, just to quote my mentor, Dallas, where there's the vision and the intentions and the means. And um, I, th- I think a great starting point is, is helping each other get in touch with those aches and say, what, where, where, where does spiritual practice connect with those, those felt needs and aches that I have in my life? No, amen to that. That's um, so good. And, and actually, in a sense, even though some of these things are good for, for us, when you initially jump in stuff, it isn't easy to actually see the truth about yourself emerge. Um, if you're in a grace filled place, it's a little easier, but sometimes it's a little scary when you're like, oh my gosh, when you see the truth about yourself, the good news is obviously God's love will pour out into your heart the second you crack open <laughs> the, mm. the darkness, but it's, it's not mm-hmm. always easy, right? And so how do you help yeah. people 
even if something's good for me, it's kind of like going to the gym, going to the gym is good for me, but it's not always fun. Right. Yeah. So, I mean, do you think it's spiritual discipline sometimes are like that? And maybe sometimes we overpromise early on when there's really some work and sometimes it's a little scary when you just kind of see your false yeah, self. Well, and stuff, just, just in general, I mean, think about what it's like if you aren't a runner and you try and run three miles, you're That's pretty good. sore afterwards, <laughs> right? <laughs> That's good. <laughs> uh, and and so they get the disciplines get easier, just like exercise gets easier with time. Yeah. And so, some people try and you know run ten miles when they haven't run in ten years, and then you're hurting pretty bad. So I think taking it slow good. and developing co some consistency. And I would also say, and this is why. This is why the book's really written to be used um, in groups and why I created this really robust um, uh, uh, curriculum called the Ninefold Path Lab that accompanies it is because these things are better taken on when we can do them in community. And my best hope for the book is that people will read through it together and then actually try on some of those practices and disciplines most of us, I like to say, um, forgive me if it's is a little raw, but most of us don't have the cojones or ovarios to make life change on our own. We need to be in a group where we're where it's a high trust group where we it's safe to be vulnerable and talk about our pain points, and then where we're being we're supporting each other to take on new life giving ways. And um, I. It's been fun for me the last few years as I've been able to lead groups through the Ninefold Path Lab. People who have been um, Christians and leaders for a long time say, wow, this, this nine weeks or this 10 weeks, my, my spiritual life has really accelerated because of the safety of this group. And it's like a, a workout for the soul, the, you know, boot camp, a beatitude boot camp, if That's you will. Good. That's really good. So, so you've talked about centering prayer a little bit. Um, in the, you know, you have the Enneagram, that's another tool. And you also have in the, one of your appendices, you connect <laughs> some of the practices with the, um, with the prayer of Aximin, the, um, the really profound kind of journaling practice. What other tools do you use in terms of kind of spiritual formation practices? Uh, and, and I guess, um, yeah, let me see what you answer that. I'm have a follow-up to that. Yeah. I mean, I think, um, I'd say for the for the lab that uh, that I developed, it's called the Ninefold Path, and it, it can be found at ninefoldpath.org. Um, uh, it's based around th um, three key practices, I guess. Um, one, but I'd add a fourth, but um, the first would be that space of mutual vulnerability. You know, I think being honest with ourselves. God and others is a beginning place for spiritual growth. And so um, the book's full of what I call animating questions yes. th that help take us, like I think so, some of us approach scripture mostly with the mind and, and the goal with the animating questions is to get it down into the heart and having us talk about our lived experience, where we have those gaps and how we want to live and how we actually live. So Col that's, that's key. Um, as a follow-up to that, um, I, am, I, th I think it helps many people to write out responses to those animating questions in kind of a journal format. Mm -hmm. So I'm a big advocate of jour journaling, particularly for Western uh, world people, Western mind people. Journaling is a form of meditation for us. Mm -hmm. uh, and I sometimes say, if, if, if centering prayer is too difficult for you because you don't have the the uh, mental structure and discipline built in maybe start with journaling Good. Uh, as, as a beginning place, because what it does is it, it helps us to, uh, to develop the inner witness, to, to, to notice what's going on in the inside mm -hmm. of us. Um, so there's a journal exercise for each of the um, beatitudes in the learning lab. And then a second thing is something we call a daily habit. And those are often, for each beatitude, there's a daily habit that's often related to a classic spiritual discipline, okay. something you can try on for five or 10 minutes a day. Um, some of them would be like breath prayers, like, uh, and, uh, like I, I find this to be a helpful discipline is when I'm sensing anxiety arising to pause 
and to um, either either uh, meditate on some scripture or I sometimes like to create my own psalms that help mm -hmm. calm me, you know. Um, uh, stopping a couple of times a day, like this is the one for the way of humility and, and pausing to remember, I am made in the divine image, a person of inherent dignity and worth as a way of trying to internalize that. And then a third feature, in addition to the daily habit is something I call the experiment, some new risk you're going to try that helps you live towards the Jesus way. It could be um, you know, in the last year, a lot of people we had in our labs after George Floyd's, uh, the killing of George Floyd, they were awakened to the call to racial justice. And so we invited people go to go to a local protest. And even if you're not comfortable participating just as an observer so that you get to sit with mourn with those who mourn. Yes. Um, or, uh, you know, and some kind of new experience. If you're part of a homogenous, dominant, uh, privileged community. Um, find a way to connect with someone this week who's of a different race and ethnicity than you as an expression of the way of peacemaking uh, mm -hmm. would be another example of that. But something that's going to take an hour to two, that's like not part of my normal um, pattern of life that will open up new horizons for me, a threshold experience. And then key to, for me, key to this is not just inviting or prescribing spiritual disciplines, but something I call the check-in mm -hmm. where after we've looked at one beatitude and taken on journaling habit and experiment, we spend some time reflecting on that as adult learners. I'm very interested in adult learning theory and, and how we grow and learn as adult yes. learners, yeah, that's good. but we don't learn um, even new experience doesn't teach us unless we have the opportunity to reflect on it. What did I notice inside as I took on that practice? How did it change the fabric of my day? Where did I struggle? And where did I find it to be hard? And when we're doing check-in in the groups, I always say, um, maybe you, maybe you failed this week and you, you didn't take, you didn't, you weren't consistent in the practice. Um, we don't want you to feel shame about that. We want you to get curious about it. Was that because of external factors that made it difficult for you to have success or did it come from internal resistance? And there's a lot to learn from our, from that resistance. Um, and it's, a, you know, failure is a good teacher or, or struggle is a good teacher. <laughs> no, that, that was, that was really helpful. And, uh, and again, at the end, I'm going to ask you about your coaching swing. Cause that, that was, I mean, you just laid out a great, powerful kind of coaching way of doing that, which again, I, I think all pastors ought to start shifting towards coaching and mentoring is just a model for doing exactly the kind of work you're doing. So that was so good. I want to ask um, one more big question. Then I'll just have some fast questions mm -hmm. at the end, but and this, this was going to be one of the first things I want to ask you, but we ended up kind of going slightly differently. When, when I read your book, the thing that I mean, we've never met before today, but when, the thing that really just jumped out was, um, you know, good for clarity. You're mm -hmm. clearly a wordsmith. Um, I love the, and you've already illustrated this. You didn't just teach the Beatitudes here. You, you have pictures, you have these practices mm -hmm. kind of before and after from whether it's, I'm going to be closed fist or I'm going to be open handed. I, you know, I love that. Mm -hmm. You did the thing with the heart, all these little cool, literally kind of embodied, making your body feel the expression. So you have that piece you have like, you know, like as a coach, I just read through this. I'm like, oh my gosh, this is like a coaching man. There's so many fantastic questions. And I liked, um, I liked even that la the, the language that you used to talk about, um, about questions. Um, can you talk about, and this is the impossible answer. So we'll see if you can actually back yourself out of this. Yeah. How did you get to the point in your life where you're not just kind of conscious, you know, you're obviously consciously competent about spiritual formation, but you've moved from being unconsciously competent. So you can, so you can actually talk about it. So how do you, how did you get to the point where you can just break things down simply find great metaphors? I mean, you got pictures. How did, how does that happen? Can you talk mm -hmm. about your creative process? Yeah. Um, some, so I think when we made that shift to wanting to, to actually practically help people follow the teachings of Jesus, that immediately led to uh, 
you know, being getting curious about what, what would, you know, for instance, what, one of my early experiences was Jesus said, do not judge. Mm -hmm. What would we need to do to learn to not judge? Yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> like how does, how does judging work? Uh, I would say I've tried to follow what I would call a, like a co co collective or communal approach. Okay. So I don't do this kind of work alone. I usually get together a group of collaborators and we wrestle with the scripture and we try and be honest with uh, about our internal mechanisms together as preparation. So um, five years before this book was written, I met with a group of people in this project called Nine Beats. And it was a group of people from three different continents, uh, male and female, um, various r racial backgrounds, uh, Black and Asian and Anglo. And we all got around talking heart to heart about what, what Jesus might have been inviting us into together. So I think that's a really important, that's been really important to me. Yeah. And, um, uh, and then I think uh, that I read a book a long time ago that you probably heard of called The Artist's Way by Julia Cameron. Mm -hmm. And um, Julia has is, is from a Catholic background, but probably doesn't strongly identify with that. But she's just great at asking really good creative questions. So I learned a lot from her method. Mm -hmm. It it brought brought things from being just objective mind oriented to subjective experiential oriented through the way she asks questions. Mm -hmm. And then um, uh, I, I, another contributing factor is uh, as we started doing the lab stuff, I I noticed some features and I I looked at some uh, adult learning theory, uh, Paulo Freire yeah. uh, and uh, Bell Hooks have both been people that have kind of confirmed some of my intuitions about how, how adult learners are best cared for and served. And it, one other thing I'll just say before I get to that creative part is that um, I, I'm a big advocate of what I would call the participant facilitator. So I never ask people to do things that I'm not willing to do myself. It's good. And um, that is a different posture for leadership where I'm also, as I lead, I'm also sh sharing vulner vulnerably and I'm a participant. I'm in that group checking in just like everybody else. And I think it, that makes for, it helps me stay humble and keeps it, keeps it fresh. But um, as far as simplifying things, um, I developed this, a first draft of the lab and that it just i just went this feels static it feels stale yeah we need some practical handles it needs to be some body postures some um simplified ways of describing things and so a, a team and i in london through this project nine beats collective put a lot of work into refining and simplifying our, our language. Um, the initial invitations that I wrote, I did probably 15 hours of exegetical work and so did my colleague. And then we'd get on these calls and say, how do we simplify this into 450 words yeah, yeah. <laughs> that, that speaks to the heart? So it's not just about um, big concepts and Greek words and cross-referencing of different themes in, in the scriptures. and. Um, the other thing that helped me uh, kind of prepare to do this is that I tried to, to share this material in as many contexts as possible. Mm -hmm. So uh, we we did a pilot of it with uh, in drug and alcohol recovery centers in California with at risk uh, street youth in London. Um, we spent time. I spent time with an Aboriginal uh, community in South Australia. Uh, with with um, folks in Bangladesh and in East Africa, and I, I really wanted to come up with something that was a bit more universal that wasn't so provincial to a, 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 a white or privileged U.S. context. And so those friends really helped refine things for me and to get them down to um, really more universal. Um, ways of, of speaking about the both the human condition and the way of Jesus. And a lot was confirmed as we talk uh, and interact in, in groups um, 
through those things too. And I think you see there's some stories in there that kind of help you see the global nature of this project too. No, that's, that's right. No, that's right. You, I mean, that was another great part about the book. You have all these wonderful stories about people you've met and even some of the things you just said. I remember reading that in the book. Now, that was a great, that was a wonderful, wonderful answer. And I loved uh, your one principle about the leader actually embodying, I, I call that the skin in the game principle. We got to actually have uh, feet on the ground mm-hmm. if we want to do that. So I, I just love that. So I, I, I'm already almost longer than I thought I was going to be. So if, um, I just want to ask you a couple quick questions there and appreciate sure. your yeah. time. Um what would be next for you, I guess? And I'm curious, um, I mean, you've written a lot of books. Is there a book in you somewhere that you've been afraid to write that you've never put pen to paper on? Yeah, well, I do intend to write a book on uh, the me- some of the theology mechanics of how we grow and change. Mm, yeah. um, for years, I've done a lab and it's part of my coaching practice, uh, a simple process of asking, where do I feel stuck? What's not working? What's the underlying body habit and script? Uh, What does kingdom reality invite me into? And what practices will I take on that will help me with that? And um, so that's, that'll be, that'll be in development. The one that I, I'm a little scared to write, but want to is a book on sexual formation. Yeah. Uh, Yeah. You know, in the church right now, uh, particularly we talk a lot about what, people should or shouldn't do with their bodies, but Mm -hmm. other people. And I think we skipped the part about talking about our own um, psychosexual development and practice. And so I, uh, I'm, uh, it's on the back burner a little bit, but I've begun to design a lab experience that would help people to talk in caring and supportive ways about their own uh, psychosexual development and what, what they feel like are their next steps towards wholeness, whether a person is male or female, married, unmarried, uh, gay or straight or uh, whatever, whatever their identification, I think there's, there's life-giving next step for, for us to pursue, um, uh, more wholeness in, in, um, in our, in our sexuality. So it'll be, it feels a little scary, but, um, I know when I mentioned it to people, they're like, yeah, we, I'd like to be in a group like that, or that seems like an important thing to, for us to be exploring. No, that's good. That's, that's really good. And I do agree. That would be, I think that's obviously a burning question to actually get down into the nitty gritty. And so it's like, you just said, it's always, it's always projection on other people, but turn it back on ourselves. And it, that would be just a really wonderful or, or painful or really illuminating <laughs> practice to actually do that digging in. So that's, that's really interesting on your own. When you, um, when you could be, you know, to be, um, this can just be, doesn't have to be a long answer, but like, I like to ask folks, what does your rule of life more or less look like? Like what keeps you grounded in a, in a you know, in, in, on the typical season for far yeah. as your rhythms? Um, for me, uh, some kind of contemplative practice every day. Yeah. Um, and that could be centering prayer. It could be um, some intentional journaling. I've gotten a lot out of listening prayer journaling or a manual journaling. Yeah. There's some good neural science that goes along with that or a long meditative walk. Mm. Um, periods of silence and solitude are very helpful to me. Um, I also uh, try and engage with the lectionary readings from the s- scriptures e- each day. And um and then Sabbath keeping and some longer periods of uh, retreat, silence and solitude are helpful to me. But there's also some, um, what I would call uh, outward journey disciplines that are just as sustaining for me. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, one would be, uh, I call it serendipity. But just as I go about my day, being open to who God brings into my path and how I might be the hands of feet of Jesus in their, their life, mm-hmm. intentional practices of being a good friend and neighbor to people who are experiencing um, homelessness or mental health challenges uh, re- really speaks to me. Being involved in local justice efforts is part of my, my uh, rule of life. I've felt more of God's presence in um, in a in a in a public vigil after someone's been killed than I've ever felt in a in a church service. Wow. You know, yeah. because it's 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 human 
pain and struggle and trying to acknowledge God's presence in the midst of, of, you know, the, the, the difficulties and brokenness in society uh, that really speaks to me. And then uh, one other one that might be a little quirky, but, but I, I, um, I find things on the sidewalk. I'm always looking for signs of God's provision in surprising ways. A lot of the clothes I wear, I, I were hand off toss offs that I found on the sidewalk wow. or, um, you know, food that somebody's left out. And then we try and be generous in the same way, setting things outside of our house that we don't need or can't use and letting other people pick them up. But it's a, it's kind of a nice way of feeling like I'm in the, the, the God's economy, not just with how God provides a salary, but like, wow, this can of uh, refried beans that I'm going to have for lunch today, you know, were, was provided in a surprising way. So. That's cool. You know, that's beautiful. And you've mentioned a lot of influences already, but if you were going to just, I mean, again, you've read a lot of books and, uh, but if you were going to say two or three books that have really helped you grow spiritually, uh, other than the scriptures, of course, uh, what would be a couple of those books mm-hmm. that come to mind? Uh, I think Spirit of the Disciplines by Dallas yeah, Willard. Great. Yeah. Um, and uh, along with that, The Divine Conspiracy ha- have been real shaping for me. Spirit of the Disciplines is my favorite book by him. Um, there's a, uh, I- I've really benefited from Teaching to Transgress by Bell Hooks. Mm. Um, and um, uh, some of Ken Wilber's work. There's a, a book I read recently called uh, no boundary that I found really helpful uh, in a kind of larger philosophical sense. Uh, I read pretty widely, so um, so not all of my recommendations are going to be what would be thought of as uh, as specifically Christian books, but because yeah, okay. I feel like I'm so much in that world, I need to get some other influences. So Daniel uh, Siegel's work on the brain and neural and the mind have been really helpful to me and seeing the connections between spiritual formation and uh, uh, neuroscience has been super helpful. And then there's a recent book um, by James Clear called Atomic Habits. That's a good book. That he's, he's a popular author, but he's distilled in a practical way the mechanisms of habit formation in a way that I haven't seen anybody else do so clearly. And I, I get a lot get out a lot out of that. No, I'm exactly the same way. I mean, if you, I mean, I got James Clear sitting right up there on top and mm-hmm. uh, probably right next to your, I think it might be right next to spirit of disciplines actually. So I, <laughs> I do the same thing. I get a lot of, I love reading widely because you get all these wonderful insights. So, I mean, yeah, there's no, uh, <laughs> no judgment for me on that or cause we're in the yeah. same boat. If that's, if there's a problem with that stuff. So that's, that's awesome. Yeah. Um, this last question. So where can people find out more about you? Obviously they can go and find Ninefold path of Jesus, Amazon, wherever books are sold. But if like, if someone was interested yeah. in, and they might be after hearing this, I mean, like if they wanted to hire you as a coach to come and speak, what are the best ways people can get in touch with yeah. you, Mark? Best, best place to go is markscandret.com. Okay. So it's um, M-A-R-K and then S-C-A-N-D-R-E-T-T-E. And then uh, our organization does have a website that I don't keep quite up as much, but it's called reimagine.org. And then the curriculum that this Ninefold Path book is based on is can be found um, at ninefoldpath.org. And um, I actually, um, s- several times a year, offer an interactive lab for leaders mm. on this material. And it's sort of my way of, of mentoring and ha- helping pastors and other leaders make the shift to a more Jesus dojo or community of practice um, culture. And uh, we offer a master class afterwards. So that can be found at my website um, as well, like sign up for that. The next lab starts on September 15th. And then I do offer coaching, particularly to leaders who want to become leaders of practice is my, is my passion. Um, and so I love walking with leaders for, uh, three, three months to 12 months and help them develop competencies, both for themselves about their, their inner journey, but also about how they effectively lead others in a holistic transformative way. Is your coaching in that, that you just mentioned, is that one-on-one or do you do groups with leaders? 
Uh, I do both. I, in some ways, the Ninefold Path Lab that we offer is is like group coaching. Okay. Um, cool. And and then I and then I do work with teams and meet with teams to do some of that. And uh, if if you want to introduce some of this to a faith community, what I often do is I'll come and do a weekend um, Friday night, Saturday, and maybe speak on Sunday as a launch for maybe small groups going through the ninefold path. And I can offer some training and resources I actually developed a toolkit. If a church wants to work through the Beatitudes, um, tools for, uh, and actually notes for how to, how to do the sermon, how to coordinate that with some small group activity and support the community on that journey too. Cool. That's so I, cool. That, well, Mark, I just want to thank you for your time. I want to thank you for, again, the, a mind that's been and a heart that's been opened up to Jesus Christ and his kingdom work and your willingness to do the, the, the hard work. I mean, talk to people all over the world, everything you just said to create such a really uh, help, a really truly helpful, fantastic book. And so just uh, blessings on your ministry. And thank you for being on the show today. Thanks, Brian. It's been so great to speak with you. And thanks everyone for listening all the way to the end. And until next time, live by faith, be known by love and be voices of hope in the world. Amen. Thank you so much for listening to this week's episode of the Deep Dive Spirituality Conversations podcast. If you found this episode helpful, would you share it with friends or others in your network? And would you consider leaving a review so to help other people find this episode? All of the resources are in the show notes, so I invite you to check those out. And I want to also say, if you're interested in learning about Centering Prayer, my book, Centering Prayer, Sitting Quietly in God's Presence Can Change Your Life, will be released in September of 2021. You can get it already on Amazon. And if you would like information about Centering Prayer and some help getting started, you can also sign up for information directly with me, go to centeringprayerbook.com. All that information is also in the show notes. I will see you next time.